<laughs> All right, so there's the co-host managing Zoom. Thank you, Anthony, and it's recording. So now I can start talking. So thank you again for coming. I think this is one of our biggest in-person turnouts. So that's really wonderful. It's great to not incentivize people to just sit in on Zoom. Um, so I'm the president. Uh, can if any board members that are here could raise their hand. If you have any questions about our society or how to get more involved, just um, reach out to us. Um, and I'd like to take a moment to uh, recognize um, those who have um, paid the ultimate price in, uh, in war for um, the freedoms and luxuries that, uh, that we have here and abroad. Um, I'd also like to remind you works. All right. I'd also like to remind you that we are on indigenous land and here, especially Aotham land. Um, Aotham have lots of herpetological place names uh, here in the Sonoran Desert, like uh, Snake Town in Maricopa County and Tumamak Hill, which is Aotham for Horned Lizard Hill, Chemamagdilag, and the Catalina Mountains are known as Baba Dog um, or Toad or Frog Mountain. They don't typically distinguish between the two, but if you look at Push Ridge, the west side of Push Ridge, you'll see a giant toad. <laughs> All right, so we have some merchandise. We encourage you to buy it, uh, lots of it. Um, we've got some uh, new totes. Uh, and brought back some old designs. We're also uh, selling raffle tickets, uh, $1 each or six for $5. Um, the items on that table over there are for raffling. And then these items are freebies on this table over here to immediately to my left. So a lot of THS members have written books, uh, including this really great one, Snakes of Arizona, Larry Jones wrote these two books. He's here tonight. Um, and the companion volumes to Snakes of Arizona are currently in the process of being written up. So they've developed this website. So if you have photographs or um, distribution notes or anything that you want to contribute to this book or to these two books, uh, you can go to this website and um, get more information. Paul Mayer is conducting a phylogeographic study of Gila monsters and is looking for genetic information. I'm just wondering about the lights. Uh, I'll, I'll get the lights. And also, for some reason, this projector is not cooperating. So um, there's nothing I can do about that. But I will get the lights in a little bit. Anyhow, um, Paul Mayer is conducting a genetic study of Gila monsters and is looking for samples. If you see a Gila monster, um, or want to know more about the project, here's his contact information. Here's a sneak peek at um, the next Sonoran herpetologist. Um, this is a green parrot snake. And the photographer Chip Edcock is here. He allowed us to use it, the, this great photograph of his. And uh, it's a significant northern range extension um, in Sonora. Can read about it in that issue. Um, we have our grants, the research fund and the Sonora Desert Code Fund. Um, the deadline for the Toad Fund is uh, in a couple of days, and the low fund is uh, next month. Um, if you Go to ACPM. There's a short story about um, the Snar Desert Toad. I was interviewed for um, sort of explaining what the big deal is with Snar Desert Toads and the psychedelics. Um, all right, so we've done some outreach. I thought I'd um, recognize uh, folks who have done outreach on our behalf because that's a big part of our mission. Um, NANCA stands for North American Nation Photographers Association, and um, these THS members helped. They've, there was about 15 photographers 
and a lot of herbs, and it was a fun time. Um, on May 8th, Sky Island Alliance had a happy hour at um, Westbound, and uh, myself and Patrick Brown uh, reached out to about 60 people. And then starting on May 20th, uh, I'll have a display of uh, venomous reptiles of Tumamak Hill for walkers, hill walkers to look at and understand, learn about. Um, and of course, the Arizona Illustrated thing. Uh, these are upcoming uh, events. If you want to help out, um, U of A's veterinary uh, club is going to analyze reptile fecal swabs. <laughs> um, and then September 2 and 3 is the U UA Fish and Wildlife Society. They're going to have a bio blitz on the Senate through the experimental range. We'll have a table there, but we'll also be leading herp walks. Um, and then September 30th and October 1st is the Tucson Reptile and Amphibian Show and Sale, which Mark Wolfson's here and who started it. Um, how long ago was that, Mark? 22 years. 22 years ago. So uh, it's a very great community event, and we uh, he, Mark gives us a free table there, and it's a great outreach opportunity, and it's a great opportunity to see really cool crit, uh, critters. Um, and then uh, we have our YouTube channel. So just like tonight, um, our, or all of the talks that we have here are recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. So for some reason you miss the talk in uh, real time, you can go back and, um, and listen to all of the fumbles and tech mistakes in the beginning <laughs> of the talk. Um, and then um, before we get to Randy Babb, um, Next month is Tom Jones, the uh, Amphibians and Reptiles Program Manager at Arizona Game and Fish Department, title to be determined, but it will be probably a historical uh, review of some sort. Um, this great photograph was taken, I think it was taken by Cecil Schwalbe, or he provided this photo of a bullfrog swallowing a bat. And it's a bat. It's, it's a bat. Yeah, so it's to show that bullfrogs are voracious and will eat anything that gets close enough for them to swallow. <laughs> um, get rid of this. Yes. All right. Um, <clears throat> Randy Babb started his wildlife career with the U.S. Forest Service on grazing impact studies in the Southwest. But soon he transitioned to the Arizona Game and Fish Department. He retired in 2019 after working for 34 years as a biologist. His chief interests are reptiles and amphibians, small mammals, invertebrates, and botany. He has had the good fortune to work on projects in the American tropics, Southeast Asia and Africa with friends and other biological professionals. So let's welcome Randy. Thank you for all for letting me come in for you for a little while. Left. Um, I'm forward and backward. Forward and backward. Okay. All right, this is already destined to have problems. Okay, so. Uh, I've been interested in exotic species in Arizona ever since I was oh, probably. Is that okay, everyone? Um, yeah. uh, probably uh, before I was 20 and I found my first Mediterranean gecko way back in uh, the 70s in, in uh, Chandler. And, and then just kind of, you know, the whole idea that something like that could be here. And so since then, ever since then, I've always been interested in what's coming and going and, and uh, and, um, and then as I started my biological career, the whole idea of what kind of impacts they might have on what stuff here. So um, basically, let's see if I do this right. Okay, that's the wrong one. Okay, so uh, the two most common means of uh, exotic species becoming uh, established or entering areas are dumped pets or escape pets and uh, stowaways and cargo shipments. And, uh, and then it kind of, the list kind of goes down from there, but far and away, when you look at it, these two are way, way, way out in front. <clears throat> um, not all 
it, um, exotic species are invasive. So basically anything that isn't found there native is an exotic species under one definition. And that's the one I usually embrace. And then invasive species are exotics that become a problem. And so they compete with native wildlife. They might cause all kinds of other difficulties. And the lists are huge. And not all exotics are problematic. And so you think about med geckos, which seem to have fallen into a, a niche that was unoccupied. We can't trace back any real problems to Mediterranean geckos. And you think about Erodium cicatarium, heron's bill, which is a plant that never gets thick enough to cause burns. It's a nutritious food for a lot of our uh, desert wildlife. And so, you know, it's the best kind of exotic to have. So the impacts of introduced species are, um, may not be apparent for many, many, many years. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the impacts range from, uh, you know, inconsequential benign to mildly troublesome to uh, eventually potentially causing extirpation of a native species. So this is, I know you all didn't come here for a philosophy lesson, and, uh, but this is something I've been pondering a long time and I figured I'd bounce it off you folks. And if you drag me out and beat me afterwards, then I know it probably didn't go over real well. But I have a lot of arguments with colleagues over at ASU and other folks um, that have a much different philosophy. So what, what I've been thinking a lot about is what amount of change has to occur before something is no longer what it is. So when I see those candy bars and it's a Milky Way, but with almonds, well, I think, well, that's not a Milky Way. That's a different candy bar with almonds in it that tastes a lot like a Milky Way, you know? And so, uh, but, you know, it's now become something else. Or is the whole idea of a system or a body, a body community some kind of immutable concept that no matter how much change occurs, it's still that thing. And so, the, like I said, this is stuff I think about a lot. And, and I don't pretend to have an answer, but I, I like to bounce it off of other people um, to get their opinion because, because I'm trying to find my way through all this. So there's a growing movement out there about that any exotic that shows up is okay because this is all the natural system. Humans have been moving organisms around the planet from ever since they were there and flux is the norm in the natural system. We all know that's truth, uh, both of those. And, um, and so uh, uh, these colonizations are normal, even if they come in on uh, as hitchhikers or something and trying to control exotics is often exo uh, super expensive and futile. And, and we know that's true. Um, it's very seldom that once Pandora's box is open, we're able to get the lid closed or even get control on it. So just to accept all this, it's less frustrating. And they, uh, you know, my botanist friends just say, you know, red brome, hug it, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> yes. you know, all this stuff, just get over it. It's there, you know, leave it alone. On the other hand, if these biomes are comprised of a set of organisms that have developed over a period of time. And if these organisms are what define that biome, then, um, I mean, then any change you make to that potentially is problematic because it's no longer what it was. It's now becoming something else. And so this is, again, this is something I've been mulling over for a long time. So uh, uh, what, you know, I would like all of you to, to contemplate that and then write a five page essay, get back, you know, I would like all of you to contemplate this. And if you've got any ideas, please email me because I would love to hear from anybody on either side or either perspective of, because I've got friends with big old brains that think both ways. And, and so, this is, I think this is a very interesting question. So how much change has to occur before something becomes something else? You know, so is that, is that still the Mona Lisa? I mean, it's Mona Lisa like, but I would argue that is not the Mona Lisa. Um, and so this is what's happening to all these systems. They are all becoming something else. And this is a global issue. So, um, we all know the Soren Desert wasn't what it was 
12,000 years ago. We know that Tucson was once a uh, kind of uh, a chaparral ponderosa pine habitat about 10,000 years ago, and it is now Arizona upland. And we know that the storm desert's not going to be what it is today, 12,000 years from now. It's going to look different because change is inevitable and organisms evolve, things move around, stuff like that. Um, but we've now entered a time in history that is unprecedented. And all these changes are driven by us as humans. These are not, um, and if you say, well, man, it's just part of the system, so it's all part of the natural thing, that's an argument. I can't really, I really don't have a defense against that. On the other hand, we should just know better. And we should be working harder, in my opinion, to maintain what's here, even though it's constantly changing and gonna become something else. So I would argue we are in a period of unnatural history instead of natural history. And, and what is our obligation to maintain that, uh, you know, the status quo, or at least these systems intact? And that gets to the whole brunt of uh, 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 invasive species, what uh, we're getting here tonight. So this is the current state of the situation. And, uh, and I got to say, this could change. <laughs> Uh, someone could walk in the door and guess what? I said, guess what? I just found a new frog over here. And that's what happened when Addie Lehman called me about a week after the field guide came out. And I could have throttled him. Um, he says, yeah, you guys didn't put this lizard in there. And I thought, I didn't even know that lizard was here. And so next thing you know, you know, another uh, established reptile uh, in the state that we were totally unaware of. And I can almost guarantee you there's something else out there that we don't know is out there that's uh, right now. So anyway, basically we've got 16 different families, 21 different species spread all over the map, uh, currently in Arizona. This is a little thing that I put together that I thought was kind of interesting. So these are all our exotic species with the date reported. Basically when we got the first bit of information about them, when they're first recognized, and some of these things they don't have dates with. So if any of you guys are able to fill in any holes in this, I'd really appreciate that because I kind of like to flesh this out and, and dig deeper into this. But look on the other side from the date reported to the estimated time of introduction. And so many of these things we're finding 15 years or longer after we figure they were introduced because by the time we find them, there's always there's already this really robust thriving population with really diverse age classes, which is not indicatively of a recently induced population. And so oftentimes we are finding these things long after um, uh, they were uh, they were introduced, and that is the norm. We very seldom catch them when they first pop up. This is a graph I put together that took quite a bit of time because I kept fiddling with it and whatnot. But basically, this is over time with the um, the date of introduction um, based over time, and you can see about 1970 the wheels fall off the cart here. It just it just starts going up uh, quickly. If I didn't do it because I didn't have the time, but if you plotted this over the growth of Arizona, I bet you would see a curve that looks almost absolutely identical. Um, and that you would find that man, you know, it just climbs up like crazy. <clears throat> so there's lots of problems with uh, detecting exotics. You know, um, it's important to catch them early, especially if, if they're going to be. Uh, a bad one, you know, uh, getting the lid back on bullfrog statewide, that's just never gonna happen. Uh, it, it, I don't think it can be done. They don't have the resources and manpower. However, there are other things that we control. We can get on top of and remove. And anytime we find an exotic species, um, we're kind of looking at, can we get rid of this thing? Can we get it out of here? Can we restore the status quo? Many exotic species are, are, are super secretive. Uh, think about, uh, uh, Bemini blind snakes, you don't, you just don't see those dark things, but they're, they're here and they're pretty darn calm as far as we know. Um, new exotic, exotic species often <laughs> resemble either existing exotic species or native stuff. And so if you were out on a trail and you had a lacerted run by you from Europe, what's mm -hmm. the first thing you would think? Well, there goes a whip tail, you know, and how often stop of a stop and look at a whip tail very close and go, uh, is that uniparens or is that, you know, whatever and stuff. We just look at them generally. And so there's a lot of herps that we all are rather negligent and we just look at them and glancing 
kind of do a mental classification, but we really don't kind of get it down into detail. And so the big thing I learned with uh, rough tail wall geckos is you see what you expect to see. And I will get back to that later. And then people often don't think to document what they see. And this is really important with native stuff and exotic stuff. And so take note of what you see. And if you see something interesting, reach out, send it to some people. You can send it to myself, you can send it to Game and Fish. You've got Dale Turner. I mean, you've got, this room is full of people that are ultra comp competent to take that to the next step. So document what you're seeing, reach out, ask questions, try to figure out what's going on. So I'm really ambivalent about the salamander because what a privilege to go out and mess around and turn a few rocks and logs and see that animal. I mean, what a stunning salamander. On the other hand, this little devil doesn't belong here. And, and so I've got to respect what we're doing. And all, the, all these slides are set up basically the same way. I've got a, a maximum snout bit link, uh, give words native to somewhere on here. And then the distribution, which will be the red dot on the map um, or the area shaded. So anyway, this is, this is a remarkable introduction scenario because we have so much information about it, which is very, very, very unusual. We know when it was introduced, we know what month and we know how many animals made up the founding population. We know the guy that did it and we know why he did it. And so you never get that information. These things just show up out of nowhere. So this guy, uh, w, or C.W. Brown, was a, uh, a professor over at a junior college in California. He was worried about incitinas uh, snuffing out. He's, he had noticed a decline in population. So he caught 22 of these guys and brought them over to Tonto Creek near the hatchery and he dumped them out in 1980. I want to think it was April, but I could be wrong on the month. And I dumped them out. Nobody knows these things are here. He doesn't tell anybody. Uh, and I am amazed that he did such a good job at picking habitat because, uh, I mean, I can't plant it. I'll put a plant in my yard and expect it to live. And so uh, much less putting, you know, picking someplace from another state and dumping it out and expecting it to make it. Uh, amazing. And so um, these things are not seen for over 40 years. And then uh, Andy Baldwin from uh, uh, Mesa Community College stumbles across them. And so we actually knew these things were here before the first Herp Field Guide came out. But we had promised Andy we would not spill the beans on it because he was convinced, despite the um, you know, uh, uh, contrary opinions, that these things were native. And he did the genetics on them, and the genetics came back and matched perfectly, of course, uh, these animals from the Polymer Mountains, which were the type of locality, or not type of locality, but the origin of this introduction. So the interesting thing about these is um, this is just ripe for all kinds of research. How much divergence has occurred over 40 some odd years with a limited population like that? How fast can these animals disperse? And so that's something I've been working on and I put them uh, a little over a mile downstream from the, uh, from the introduction site. I have no idea how far out into the extending uh, habitat these things are. Uh, we, we really don't have uh, any idea, uh, just exact footprint of them. If you look back over state of its literature and stuff like that, these things become really dense in some of the California habitats. And we're talking about well over 200 animals per hectare um, that, 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 uh, that these habitats can support. It looks like that's what's going on in this Tonto Creek area. These things have hit it. They've done really, really well. They are really abundant, and, uh, but they're very seasonal in their activity. So you can't just expect to go up there any old time and turn a log or a rock and find them. Uh, there are big periods of time, just like where they live in their native habitat, where they're just not accessible. Um, as far as we can tell, uh, they've fallen into a niche here in Arizona that nothing's utilizing. So we, you know, again, we're, we just learned about them recently and started working, doing stuff with them, but uh, they don't seem to be competing with anything. They don't seem to be causing any problems. We even had an elegant uh, or wandering garter snake eat one. Uh, <laughs> we found it in his stomach and the snake had no ill effects. And if you know about incitinas, they got really nasty toxins in their tails. 
And so if that car, you would think it would start killing stuff like cane toads in Australia or something, that doesn't seem to be happening. And, and so, and then another interesting thing is that they're doing pretty much, as far as we can tell, um, what they're doing in California at this point, but they're also active with our summer rains, which they don't have on the Pacific coast, which is primarily a winter rain system. And so these guys are moving around with our summer rains too. So that's pretty darn cool. You've got an exotic species dumped out over here and all of a sudden it just starts going with the flow. And it's, it's anytime it's wet, it's up, it's moving around doing its things. Uh, so one animal we just uh, sampled recently, they're, uh, it looks like they're just getting ready to lay eggs right now, which is about on track with California egg laying um, or Pacific Coast egg laying for the species. So anyway, we're still, like I said, we're still trying to learn all this kind of stuff. Again, no way we can get these, get rid of these things. We, our first approach was, let's see if we can do it. And we got into it in the first samples, you know, we were finding uh, 60 animals, you know, in a couple hours of effort during the right time of year. And so just, I mean, they're here, they're in, the habitat's so complex, even if people removed everyone, you're not gonna get rid of them. So at this point, I kind of look at them, you know, up, I'm actually kind of fond of them, but, uh, but uh, I mean, you know, uh, they're here to stay. And uh, the problem is now to keep people from moving them around. And so we don't, um, and you know, beautiful little animal like that, why not take it up to the White Mountains and dump it and stuff like that. So that is, um, if I should have prefaced everything, it's against the law to move or release animals here in the state. It's actually uh, a citable offense. So anyway, you know, we're afraid of that. And we do run down any tips about these elsewhere, but it seems like they're, they're just found where they're at. Tiger salamanders. This has been a mess ever since I can remember. So that green area is um, a Pollyanna perspective on where the native tiger salamanders are found. And the red, red area is the Pollyanna perspective on where the exotics are found. Mm. But that's really what it is. So in general, south of the Colorado Plateau, um, you have uh, you have introduced tiger salamanders, and up on top, and then a few other places like San Rafael and what those are all native tiger salamanders. But it starts way way back in the '40s with bait animals being brought in for uh, the fishing uh, tackle shops, and they're bringing these animals in from Kansas and New Mexico and all over the Midwest, and they're dumping them into ponds. So they can have their own stocks of salamanders to uh, to sing out themselves at the bait the bait stores, and so immediately you've taken the genetic pool and you've made a big huge stir here, and figuring out what's what is really really difficult. So this has caused a great deal of consternation. And this paper by Low Low 1954, that's a great little paper. And even though uh, Ambystema tigrinum and the other Um uh, Utahensis is no longer recognized. All the other stuff is pretty darn good information and it's held up all over the test of time. Uh, so um, some recent research suggests that the uh, uh, um, barred tiger salamanders in Cochise County and right along the Mexico uh, line might be native. So some of those in, in the Sulphur Springs and uh, uh, San Bernardino Valley might actually be native animals. I've heard some uh, contrary remarks to that, so I haven't really looked into it deeply, but that's something that's been thrown out there. Um, the uh, uh, easiest way, and this works most of the time, is the bellies of Mavordium Mavordium are boldly patterned and look pretty much like the dorsum. And nebulosum are either spotted or very weakly barred or plain. And uh, it took me forever to figure this out. I was so happy. I mean, like I was like, my year's been made. I got, I figured out how to do this because it, it, uh, you can get uh, nebulosum looking just like the salamander in this picture, uh, which was collected uh, just out of pace and off the control road. And so anyway, uh, Cats out of the bag, nothing you can do about it. We don't know what kind of impacts we're dealing with with tiger salamanders. We know that they uh, eat leopard frog tadpoles. They don't prey on native fish, the uh, larvae will. Um, we, um, 
We know that they're pretty good dispersers, that they're very long lived. And uh, the Game and Fish Department uh, has um, banned the importation of water dogs for as fishing bait uh, quite a while back. But again, too little, too late. You know, it's something that should have been done earlier. One of the other things I ought to point out, and um, it's easy to get bitter about all the mistakes that have been made. And, um, but most of us in this room, matter of fact, I would dare say all of us in the room, had little to do with those mistakes. And so we can point favors and we can blame, but we're all better people now and we know better. And so just like so many other things in all our past, uh, whether you want to call it slavery or point at a million of uh, misdeeds that have been done, uh, we can all try to be better people now and go on. So I try not to think about all the screw ups that have been done and think more about where we're at and what we do to fix it. Yeah. Are they normally that fat? No, that thing. I, I, I took a picture because it looked like it was on its way back from you know White Castle Burger or something. I mean that 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 was a huge and it was big. It was and so a really big adult tiger salamander can reach thirteen inches. Wow! And that thing was close. It was about eleven. Um, yeah, I'd never seen one that big. So I mean. I thought it was a Gila monster up near, you know, <laughs> crossing the road. So, yeah, it, uh, it's unusual to, to see something that robust and stuff, but they, they are big animals. African clawed frogs. So this is a, one of the Tucson favorites, right? It's right here, down here in North Tucson. Um, that's the only locality that we know that it occurs. So these frogs are sub-Saharan Africa uh, native. They were imported like crazy when, it, when you found, uh, they found out you could take the urine from a pregnant woman and inject it into a, uh, a clawed frog and it would immediately start laying eggs and stuff. So it would uh, go into reproductive mode. So they were used for pregnancy tests and they were imported all over the world. I mean, by the gajillions. And our very own Chuck Lowe um, and uh, J.T. Vignera, so here's, here, you know, how would you like your name associated with this? I'm sure Chuck's rolling in his grave. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, they took a bunch of these and they dumped them all over the place, including Sabino Canyon. And thankfully, for some mysterious reason, all those populations failed, except for the one on Arthur Pack, which is now Cook Tree Golf Course. And so that golf course, as far as I could tell, was established in 1977. So I think we can assume that population was uh, introduced about that time, somewhere prior to 1980, because I don't believe Lowe was moving any of these animals around since then. The scary thing about Xenopus, if they've been implied in all kinds of problematic things, including the spread of chytrid fungus and, um, and their voracious predators, those things, uh, when I've watched them in Africa, there isn't anything that they won't eat that they can catch if they can shove it in your throat. They're surprisingly um, immune to or resistant to desiccation. So uh, they live in a lot of areas that I visited in, uh, in South Africa, Namibia, where um, these things just dry to like cement and the rains come and those suckers have been buried in the mud and they're back up. And so they're really crappy dispersers on the land, but when it's wet, they'll get up and move, albeit awkwardly, but they move. And I've been out on Arthur Pack Golf Course during the rainy season and found mummified ones out on the greens where they had tried to get out probably during the storm and couldn't get back to anywhere by the time the sun came up. How big is that? They are pretty good size. So they're so snout vent. We're talking a big one about like this. You cannot catch these by hand. <laughs> they are like trying to grab a bugger. They are uh, they are slimy and fast and agile. And uh, so the only way I've ever been able to catch them is with nets or with traps. They are, uh, I've tried to hand grab and catch their five. So um, the good news is these things haven't really spread anywhere. And um, I think they might spill over to into that big wash during really wet summers just outside of the golf course. And those will hold puddles for a long time. But, um, and conceivably, those could even get blown downstream and in the inner parts of the Santa Cruz. But so much of the Santa Cruz is dry in different segments up here. Uh, even if that happened, not likely to persist. So uh, 
whatever it is, this is the only place they've been and they've, and they've stayed there for the most part. I've got to go down and collect catpoles for the new book. Um, the cat, catpoles, if you've ever seen them, just like little catfish, they've got big long whiskers, really different. And they're plankton feeders, which is also really different than most tadpoles. So uh, really an interesting animal. We'd rather not have it, but since it's state put, nobody's really made any effort to get rid of it. Northern leopard frogs. So northern leopard frogs, as you can tell by the yellow area there, runs broadly distributed all across northern Arizona, across Colorado Plateau. And slow, and when I was a kid, I remember seeing them at all the lakes when we go up trout fishing. So slowly they all died out for one reason or another and uh, and disappeared. A handful of populations persisted. One of the biggest populations was right around Stoneman Lake. And that was a whole series of interconnected small ponds and water areas. And it had a really big, robust population. Uh, so when looking at recovering this species, of course, they do genetics on that. And they find out that that population has uh, been um, polluted with genes from northern leopard frog from the northeastern United States and southern Canada. So that genotype up there. We have no idea how they got there, but we figure that it happened sometime before 1994, but not a lot before. You know, you might be talking maybe a decade or so, but 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 not much. We're not talking distant past. So this was a fairly different hybrid or recent hybridization event. The best theory is that these frogs actually um, were released pets because um, I mean. All of us, if you've gone into pet stores at one time or another, has seen tadpoles for sale in there. And that's not supposed to happen now, but it did in the not too distant past. Also, it was fairly popular as a lab animal and you could order them from Carolina Biological Supply, use them in your lab for stuff. And I know of schools um, that raised them in their classrooms so kids could watch the metamorphosis of the tadpoles. And then they uh, unwittingly, or I should say um, uninformed, took the tadpoles or the froglets out and released them. And so that's a, that I think is the most possible scenario of these. The idea that they became introduced to bait animals as bait animal or you know, with a, a, a fish stocking, not very likely because uh, fish stockings up there are made in trout and those are raised in state. And um, as you'll see a little bit later, starting about in the 1980s, about mid 1980s, Game the fish department really buckled down because of some debacles about what goes out in loads of fishes. And so uh, to try to prevent things from uh, getting moved around. All right, our buddy, the Rio Grande leopard frog. And this is the frog that's going to conquer Arizona. So uh, they start out way, way back when, way down here in Yuma. Um, and, uh, and they're now threatening to enter Lake Pleasant. And uh, matter of fact, Tom Jones and some of my other uh, colleagues are out there waging war on them right now. So they first start, pop up in the early 80s, uh, single animals found, they go out and look around and they find out, bam, there's a well-established population. So they do genetics on them, Platts and his team, uh, Jim Rohrbaugh was part of that team, um, do genetics on them. They found that the genotype best matches frogs around Dexter National Fitch Hatchery um, in um, in New Mexico. However, the mystery is the game and fish department at that time wasn't really taking fish from Dexter and moving them to Arizona, but they were from further east in Texas, but those didn't match the genotype real well. So still some questions, but the most plausible uh, avenue for introduction on these things were basically stowaways and fish stockings that went down to the Yuma area and they got out. They quickly, before this paper was even done in 1990, um, as they were close to press with it, there's a note on the end of it that says, oh, we just got a report from them up near the bridge um, just, uh, just south of Buckeye. Um, and, and that was already put them like another 30 miles plus up the river than they found during their research. And, uh, and in that time, they had moved all the way up into Phoenix. The goal, has always been to keep them out of the Salt River and keep them from getting into other river systems. If we can keep them confined to the lower Gila, that system goes dry frequently and with little pieces of it that are wet. There's a variety of canal systems and stuff in there that the frogs um, are moved into and are persisting in, but 
try not to let them get into where they're going to do any damage or any more damage. They've already done a hell of a job of displacing native leopard frogs, uh, Rani Gavapinensis, the lowland leopard frog. And pretty much everywhere these guys show up, they disappear. And part of the problem is they look so much like um, a lowland leopard frog that just looking at a leopard frog there in the right, and the habitat they inhabit is historically lowland leopard frog habitat. And lowland leopard, leopard frog still persist in many of those habitats within Verlanderi um, colonization. It's always a mess. I mean, every time we get this, you know, I saw a leopard frog, well, what was it? And then we go through all these hurdles and stuff. And even though this seems like, oh, I can look at this thigh right away and tell you, I can tell you when you look at this thigh, you're thinking, well, is that densely reticulated or is that lightly reticulated? And you can look at these sometimes and say, well, that's not as densely reticulated as that picture in the book. And so it's never as clean, as neat as you would really like it to be. But these things are a big problem and, and we really want them gone. I don't think we can ever get them in their, under control. And they are one of the most amazing dispersers of all the frogs I've seen. Um, I don't know, has anybody read that paper about, um, I used to be kind of amazed that leopard frogs um, and bullfrogs and stuff would just pop up randomly in these water holes. And I'm thinking, well, they must just go out in all directions and a bunch of them die and a few of them make it there. And that was kind of the old wisdom. Well, there was some work done recently and I can't find the paper again, but I think it said that frogs uh, can see atmospheric distortions over bodies of water and they migrate towards them. So it's not a random dispersal at all. These guys are looking way out and saying, there's water over there. I'm going to go see if I can make it. And I've got to believe that because in uh, the Rainbow Valley, there's some ponds out there in the middle of that valley that are literally tens, if not twenties of miles uh, away from any canals or other water systems. And there's doggone uh, Rio Grande leopard frogs in there. How in the heck do those things get there? So, uh, um, uh, they are, they are, like I said, they are amazing. But uh, again, just this spring uh, or last year, they started finding uh, frogs and egg masses in some of the trips to Lake Pleasant. Uh, they started removing them there. Breeding's commencing right now and they're trying to get rid of them. Uh, they're still fighting to get rid of them. So they made great inroads, but um, they really want to get them out of that area. Pacific chorus frog. This is one of those things that kind of is just here. So uh, it's thought that these populations right here along the Colorado River are native, and but we've had them pop up in urban areas, mainly at greenhouses and in places like that. So um, uh, Jim Rohrbach, Jeff Howland, myself did a little paper on them and what they were doing way back in 2004. And um, in the 1980s, and part of my interest in all these uh, um, exotic species, there was a nursery in Chandler where I grew up that these things were established and they were breeding in the in this big swamp cooling system for the greenhouse, full of tadpoles, frogs of all size classes you can find there. They were doing really well. And that population persisted from about 83 to 2002 when they destroyed that nursery. Um, we don't know that these things are breeding anywhere in Arizona outside of the Colorado River. But I would really be interested in finding out if anybody sees that or anything. But we do know that these frogs come in really frequently on plants from the Pacific coast. And so uh, we get calls from Home Depot and Lowe's and Walmart and for people who buy a pot of plant, they bring it home and there's a frog in it. And this is the guy. Um, and so they, they are great hitchhikers. They just, I just think it's too arid here and, uh, you, uh, you know, all the way around for them to persist outside of some kind of special situation. This is a fairly recent uh, uh, advent to the state. Um, this is the uh, cliff, or Rio Grande chirping frog, formerly cliff chirping frog, or uh, it used to be in the genus Seropus, and now it's uh, a Luther dactylus, and it used to be Cystignathoides, and now it's Campot. And so you, if you look in that field guide by those doofuses, you'll see that it's mislabeled. And that's because the genetic stuff came back after that thing was published. And uh, the vet who was doing the genetics for us said, oh, by the way. Um, and so, but well, I uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad I can spell camp by. I don't think I could spell, uh, I can't even say it. So anyway, 
This frog pops up in a neighborhood in South Phoenix in 2015 from a single animal. And so uh, Diego Ortiz Carrillo and Tim Coda and a, I can't remember who else, uh, another fellow, they get really interested. They start looking for the frog. They find it everywhere in this neighborhood and they can hear it calling. I'm too old. I can't hear high pitch sound anymore, but they, it makes a very high pitch little kind of sound. And they, they stroll through these neighborhoods during uh, summer monsoon time. They're in that yard. They're in that yard. They didn't even have to get permission to go on the property. They could tell where these frogs were. So um, by the time they were discovered, this frog had already become well established. And the really interesting thing is these things um, have direct development. So the frog actually digs a hole in the ground like a turtle and lays an egg in it and covers it up. And then the egg hatches out to a little frog. So a really novel reproductive uh, 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 life history compared to what our what we're used to. But you can see that it's only going to work where it's really moist. And the thing about this herd ranch neighborhood is it's a very old neighborhood or a neighborhood that's built on old um, citrus orchards. So it has irrigation. The whole place has blood irrigation. And that's where these frogs got their foothold. Um, it's already been demonstrated that they've been spread all over Texas and parts of Mexico through the nursery trade. Again, they're hitchhikers and potted plants and things like that. And they got into these neighborhoods. There's a couple very big nursery outlets immediately adjacent to this neighborhood. So that's probably the source for these. And we interviewed the people at the nurseries and we were looking around for them. We didn't have much luck, but I'm, I'm still convinced that's where they came from. So anyway, um, uh, a uh, little tiny guy um, and only in that one spot, probably can't leave that neighborhood. However, uh, um, if they were to get into a really mesic situation like Sonoida Creek or something, would they be able to persist? And so, you know, maybe so. Uh, and those, of course, those are always things that we worry about. Okay, everybody's favorite invasive species, um, and I do mean invasive, uh, the uh, uh, American bullfrog. This is the known distribution of the thing. This has uh, amazing history. Um, so while I was researching this and I was digging around through newspaper archives and going back to all kinds of historic stuff, I didn't realize it, but the United States was stinking frog crazy in the late 1800s. They loved frog legs. It was a huge, huge deal. And you can see, look at, uh, you know, look at this, 1902. Here's a, a, a manual on how to raise branded frog. And they were really, bullfrogs were kind of the king because they got so big and had great big old legs on them. But any branded frog was going to do it, whether it was ranaclamatan or if it was the green frog, or I mean, that is the green frog, or, um, or not, uh, um, Anyway, any decent sized ranted frog was, was game. And matter of fact, this uh, bullfrog illustration is, um, uh, an, uh, I should say 1898. So there's how uh, adroit I am at when I put this together. Um, he, uh, that is a manual put out for by the National Fisheries on how to raise fish commercially. And uh, there's a big section on raising frogs. Um, and so, uh, again, already the stage is set for this thing to come in. So I could not pin when bullfrogs first come into the state, but it's got to be somewhere around the 1900s, probably 20 years on either side of that. Uh, um, and we certainly, um, this frog-like thing is, is huge, and they're moving frogs all over the place, I found. Railroad schedules with boxcars full of frogs on their way to, uh, you know, this place and that place originating all over the Southwest and everything. Matter of fact, Aravaca was a huge frog collecting place and it fed um, in the uh, 1800s. It was feeding all the diners and wow. restaurants in uh, in Tucson here with a leopard frog legs, Chiricahua leopard wow. frog legs, by the way. And so, uh, um, and it was a big, big business. So the earliest I start seeing bullfrogs are popping up about 1919, 1923. I come, um, 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 I come across 
a um um oh see i i goof this up so uh uh the 1917-18 date is not quite right. Um, and, uh, but I find a record of a bunch of Louisiana bullfrogs being brought in, dumped in by, uh, by oh, the Salt River just outside of Phoenix with the promise of thousands more. Um, so two shipments uh, in consecutive years. Oh, here it is right here. 1926-1927, um, uh, uh, that's the right date. And, um, and so a big deal, I mean, bullfrogs are so popular and the raids are reported in the newspaper all the time. And even when guys go out uh, fishing and stuff, they kill a few bullfrogs, you see the, uh, uh, the reports pop up. So to aggravate the situation, you know, you got all this mess happening before there's even a game fish department proper. In the 1960s, starting in uh, the 1960s and stuff, game and fish department starts moving bullfrogs all over the place. And in the period between um, uh, right here, 1967 and 82, 401,270 bullfrogs are moved, uh, uh, introduced into 40 different locations around the state. That's just, uh, and I, that's a pretty good, I mean, that was a pretty accurate thing. I know that's not, not the whole story. I know there's records that didn't make it in there. So that's a whole bunch of bullfrogs being put out. And of course, the Game and Fish Department, especially in the 60s and stuff like that, is all about what, you know, providing sporting opportunities and things to put on your table. And so they're a wiser organization now, but like everybody, all the other organizations, they've got egg on their face over this. This is a difficult problem, but again, I have a hard time blaming them for being ignorant back when everybody was ignorant. Um, so here's the earliest mention of bullfrog. It predates that big stocking. Um, and here, you know, this guy gets some carp and stuff like that. One bullfrog alleged to weigh in the neighborhood of three pounds. So it, was a, it was a big one. I don't know if that's accurate or not. A real tendency to exaggerate on sizes in these old papers. But it makes the paper in, uh, in 1919. Here's a bunch more uh, dug up for me. Here's the quotes from there. 52 large bullfrogs were bagged about six miles down uh, the Salt River yesterday afternoon. This is right after they stock all those bullfrogs in the Salt River. Um, well, that, and those are brought over by the feds from the Federal Fisheries Bureau. And so, um, and so, but this one is earlier here. Um, and so they're here and, uh, and make a bad, you know, bad situation gets just worse. So um, here's a, a joiner, who, which is one of the, the infancy of the Arizona Game and Fish Department. They had this commission and the state game wardens and all this kind of stuff. But one of his big uh, successes he touted was stocking lakes and ponds with bass and jumbo bullfrog. And so um, uh, this, this was a big part uh, of the state. It was wildly popular and it was happening all over on a pretty large scale. There's plenty of blame to go around to everybody, every entity on this mess. So, you know, what do you do with this? So it wasn't long. Um, um, and what's interesting, looking at the stocking records I had to mention, is you see about the start, I think after 82, bullfrog stocking cease. And not long after that, you start seeing stockings of native fish and you start seeing stockings of Terracalla leopard frog all over the state. And what happens about then? Well, that's the advent of the non-game program. And who was the first non-game uh, uh, herpetologist for Cecil Schwabe? And so guys like him and Dean Hendrickson and Barry Spicer, they changed the way the game and fish looked at wildlife and wildlife management by thinking about native species. And they laid the groundwork for, I mean, those guys really, you know, you like condors, you got those guys to think. You like, you like Mexican gray wolves, those are your guys. You like black-footed parrots, think the non-game brand. So, those guys changed the whole landscape of everything that was done after that. So I can't tell you how appreciative I am of that. So these bullfrogs, we know they're a nightmare. And as you saw the picture of the bat, um, uh, I was there on a lot of those early bullfrog control things down there in San Bernardino. One of my favorite parts was taking them apart um, and looking in their stomach. 
full grown cotton rat. I couldn't swallow a full grown cotton rat. Um, bats, birds, native fishes, garnish, pepsi swaps. What, what can eat a pepsi swap? Full grown tarantulas. I mean, it was, I was gobsmacked by all the cool stuff we're pulling out of these frogs' stomach. And uh, so amazing. They, uh, you know, and there are records of them eating baby alligators and lots of turtles, things like that. So anything a bullfrog can get in its mouth and swallow, it will eat. So no small, uh, you know, uh, revelation that they're a big problem here. So in the 1980s, Cecil, Phil Rosen, both uh, members of this August society here, um, they start uh, trying to control bullfrogs down on San Bernardino Wildlife Refuge. And I had the privilege because Cecil and I were good friends um, to be down there on a lot of those early ones uh, helping out. And um, that went on for years and years. And despite killing up to four, 400 bullfrogs or more a night for many years consecutively, many successive nights, there were, uh, they never got a handle on those bullfrogs. They were never able to control them. One of the problems, there was a big population just across the border in Mexico that they couldn't touch. The others, they were confined to working only on the refuge. So frogs could move in uh, elsewise. Also, another problem is they couldn't do anything with the tadpoles because there were a lot of uh, endangered fish in there. And so seining and trapping and stuff like that was problematic. Uh, um, so they had to target the adults and you and and they uh, I was convinced that there was no way you could ever control bullfrogs because of my experiences there. Uh, so when Tom Jones tells me they're going to start getting rid of bullfrogs down by Pina Blanca, I just laughed at him and, and said, yeah, good luck with that. That's not going to happen, you know. And I went down and helped a little bit and stuff like that. But I really played, a, a you know, a next to zero role on that. But lots of people in this organization and lots of other groups helped out a lot with bullfrog control in there. In a two-year period, they were essentially able to eliminate the bullfrog population within an eight-kilometer circle around Pina Blanca Lake. And after they did that, the chair cow leopard frogs and little and leopard frogs came back like you wouldn't believe. They, they showed up in places they hadn't been seen in 30 years, just bam. And that happened within like two years after they were eradicated. Now this is an ongoing thing because outside of that circle, there's still bullfrogs and there's always bullfrogs moving in. And Addy told me that he thought he saw a bullfrog at Pina Blanca uh, recently. I think if you see that, Tom Jones would always be interested in knowing that kind of information. But it's something you can never rest on. This is an ongoing thing, and it'll have to be continued into uh, perpetuity. This is a this is a net full of bullfrog tadpoles. That's out of one pond, and I think that was a single sane hall. Some of these sane halls, they uh, were getting over ten thousand tadpoles out of a single sweep through a pond, one pond. And so the you know. This is why bullfrogs are so incredibly difficult to control, but it can be done, but we will never achieve it on a state right basis. Um, it, there's just not the manpower and the money to do it, but it can be done luckily, locally. And I know Dennis Caldwell and some other folks have been working down at La Siena Diaz, and they've got that pretty well cleaned out. And they're working at some areas down near the Elgin Research Station, I believe. And, um, and there's also some work going up on yard. So if we can pick our battles, choose critical spots to make a stand and eliminate bullfrogs from that, we can give native leopard frogs a real boost up. And, and that's kind of the strategy right now. And maybe someday in the near future, we can link those spots together in the areas that are largely devoted to bullfrogs. <clears throat> Ready your slider. I looked and looked and looked. I can't tell you much about this guy. However, I think this is probably the most likely story. I can see a lot of folks that are my age in here and, and maybe even a little older, and we all remember dinosaur turtles. And as far as I could find, starting in the 30s with the advent of dime stores, there, uh, the baby turtles were there. They start bringing baby turtles in by the beginning. And they were pretty indiscriminate because I remember as a kid going in there and saving up my buck 50, you know, and buying. Um, you know, a, uh, a map turtle. And, um, and there were always raider sliders, by far the most predominant turtle, but there was occasional cooters and uh, dirachiles and other things that popped up in there just kind of randomly, willy-nilly. But they were obviously going for what they could get the most of. These things were 
and exported from uh, wherever they were getting to all over the United States by the gajillions. And this happened all the way up into the 1970s uh, when uh, the um, um, Department of Ag or Health or something goes to that four inch rule because of salmonella problems with children. And so they shut that thing down and you stop seeing them everywhere. And so you can still get a baby turtle if you want and they pop up other places, but you can't, you can't walk into a dime store and buy them anymore. I think these are probably the most, the foundation for all the stocks that we have today. However, those stocks are constantly augmented with an endless supply of unwanted pets mm. that people are constantly dumping out and letting go. I mean, I remember having a little bowl like this of the palm tree. My, my turtle loved that palm tree. And, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, but back of comic books, you know, Boys Life magazine, anything you could get these get these things like this so um this is kind of a mess and but not much has done about it and the only two control efforts i'm aware of with uh, uh aquatic turtles um trachemy script in particular was the phoenix zoo and um myself and bill berger started that trapping program about 20 years ago and our fear was the uh Tempe town lake had not come into existence yet. And I was afraid, and I, and I think looking back on it unjustly so, that those guys would get from the Phoenix Zoo, which is just north of there, into Tempe Town Lake, and then have an easy avenue to travel up the Salt River. And so the idea was that everybody loves seeing the turtles as they go into the Phoenix Zoo and, and you walk across the bridge and they're all over there. Well, the idea was to not eliminate the population by hamstring it, instead by removing all the uh, females and leaving the males. And uh, research shows that if you take X number of females out of these populations of turtles, this has been done by Justin Cogman and other folks, you really put a hurt on them in a hurry. So uh, we started doing this and we did this for many years. I think they've now stopped it. But basically 98% of the turtles were trachomy scripted that were caught at the zoo. But there were 19 different species from all over the world, including I remember a one big macroclemys about this big that weighed you know, about 65 pounds that was living in that pond that was only about that deep. I don't know how anybody ever did see it, but that probably explains why the ducks never really did well in the pond. <laughs> uh, anyway, it was, uh, it's pretty amazing. The other one was, I remember 1980 going down with my, uh, uh, on a field trip with my biology class uh, when I was at the university to uh, Keto to Keto, and it was full of trachomy script. And uh, uh, several years back, the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service went and got all those guys out of there. And as you know, it's been now renovated and stuff. And it's all about uh, uh, um, kind of sturm sonori longer from Morales uh, now. So it's, uh, they're trying hard to restore it and put all the native fauna back intact in there. So the thing with Chrysomy Picta, it's pretty much the same thing, except for we've got this little population up here by St. John's that we're pretty sure is native. And uh, that has been there for as long as anybody can determine. There's no real good reason for them to be there. So whether this is a disjunct population, naturally occurring disjunct population, or some people claim that through trades with Native Americans, they dumped them there and they got established, who really knows? But we treat it as a native population. But, uh, um, uh, uh, painted turtles, Chrysomys pictus was the second most common turtle, and it was a distant second, mind you, uh, that we got out of the zoo pond. So uh, again, broadly distributed, pops up anywhere. But we think of all these aquatic turtles as pretty much the same. They, um, you are likely to see anything in a pond. Don't be surprised. Anything that comes to the pet trade could end up in a pond. Good old common snapper. Um, so big old guy, um, we can't, I can't figure out where these guys came from. All I can figure is it probably was a bullfrog slash uh, softshell turtle story. So again, these things are bring, probably brought in early on as a food animal. And the thing about food, I mean, they're popular dietary items even today in parts of the Southeast, and they get big. 
you know, uh, like 45 pounds or so for a big caudal snapper. So there's, there's a lot of meat on it. So it's a good turtle if you're going to eat it. You know, you don't want to eat Sonora mud turtles. You want to eat that guy because it's going to have a lot there. Snapping turtles are a big problem. They're uh, a, a voracious predator. They uh, There was a paper I read about them killing full-grown Canada geese. Um, and which you think, how can that even happen? But as the geese are feeding underwater, they grab them by the neck and just drown them. And then they tear them apart and eat them. So a really, really impressive predator. Though they're widely occurring, we cannot tie any declines or any real problems to common snapping turtles. They just pop up randomly around the state. The other thing is we've never found any good signs of reproduction. And so if any of you guys find a baby snapping turtle, please call me. Um, yeah, I we want to know about it because we think they're reproducing because we keep getting them so regularly. And we even get relatively small ones and we get some really big ones, but, but we're not finding the little guys. And so we, we just can't nail it down. And so if we think reproduction is occurring, it's going to be in big urban centers like Tucson. It's going to be in Phoenix. It could be in portions of the Salt River, could be in portions of San Pedro. We, we really don't know, but any kind of evidence like that, we would really like to get that information. Spiny softshell turtles. This is the first exotic perp to be introduced to the state way back in 1899. And I find this article about McCarty. And if you've ever read anything about McCarty, McCarty was this amazing guy in the 1800s that was collecting for the National Museum, and um, and he was you know he was sending tortoises all over the place, all kinds of cool stuff. He's like the original um, you know field collector for all of these big institutions here in Arizona. And there's a great story around him because he disappears. They think. His widow, he is alive and he's hiding out, so they won't give the widow his pension or any of the insurance money. Eventually, they find him dead with a bear skin tied to his back up on the Colorado Plateau. <laughs> and so, like three years later or something. So, I mean, if you want to read about an interesting guy, McCarty's the guy. He's a really interesting guy. But he's uh, Game and Fish Department, or not Game Fish Department, uh, State Game Warden, and he brings in two big shipments of snappers from uh, Louisiana, I think it was, and, uh, um, and Ar Arkansas, and uh, I don't know, the bullfrogs are from Louisiana. So he brings them in from Arkansas, and he dumps them in the Verde River. And this, again, back then, turtle soup is every bit as popular as bullfrogs, and this is a huge thing. And most of the turtles that are coming to market for Tucson, and they're bringing live ones by wagon, in the 1800s, up from the Sea of Cortez, live sea turtles, displaying them in the general store, slaughtering them and eating wow. them that night. And so you can find that all in the newspaper. If, if, if you're kind of a history buff like I am, getting newspaper.com a subscription to that, thumbs up. That's a real, uh, the problem is you'll never leave it. It's just a wormhole. Um, so um, lots and lots of interesting stuff going on with this. So anyway, these soft shell turtles get put in. Um, they apparently do really well because the next thing you know, they're popping up all over the place. But here's an article, 1888. So even uh, you know earlier, and there's already snapping turtle or a uh, soft shells turtles popping up. So probably like bullfrog, there's a long history of dragging these things over here, releasing them, and there were probably big punctuated releases where they let these things go in Arizona. Here's another one. Um, Indian Springs, you know, uh, um, uh, they drain the pond, find some snapping turtles. Look at this. I love this article. You know, so 1908, these things are still a novelty. Nobody really knows what they are, but they're going to eat them anyway. Um, and so you know, a head like a seahorse. I love that. So uh, um, and then you look in here, real turtle soup. This guy finds a snapping turtle in a canal in Tempe. Uh, the commissioner of the canals, and he's going to he's going to eat that thing. And so, um, and then as you go on, as you get into the 30s, um, uh, late 20s and 30s, they're the rage. You know, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, soft shell turtles fall for easy prey to baited hooks and stuff like that. So they're just like a regular game fish or anything else. They're out there. Go get them. And uh, but already they're getting them out of Roosevelt Lake. 
they're getting them out of San Carlos, they're getting them all over the state. So probably again, the big appeal is that they get so big. A big female soft shell gets 30 plus pounds. So a big turtle that you can eat. And uh, these things again are found all over the state to this day. And matter of fact, I was pretty appalled at the number of them in the lower San Pedro. Um, uh, recently on a trip down there, it was, it was amazing. They were, I mean, there's not many places I could just go out and see a soft shell turtle, but if I had to catch one tomorrow, that's where I would go. So uh, uh, anyway, they're doing well. Again, we can't tie them to any specific problems with native fauna or habitat. And so we can't really hang anything on them. I wouldn't call them a benign introduction because we know they're preying on native fishes and leopard frogs and all kinds of stuff like that. But are they a really problematic one? Honestly, got to say probably not. <laughs> New Mexico whiptail. I've got nothing on this darn thing. Um, I couldn't find the original paper where they're described about or uh, described being found here in Arizona. So if anybody's got that or can kick that over to me, I would love to adapt this. Uh, only thing I've got is they pop up in Stebbins in 2003 in the uh, petrified forest near, and they were found near the Perco ruins. And then uh, a few years later, they pop up in uh, uh, south of the interstate in the southern part of the, of the, of the monument. Other than that, uh, we think that most likely releases, but we don't know that for sure. Um, so, so again, one of these things we just don't have any information on. But is, is he like the other quick tail? Because he, he looks to me like something I've seen running around. He looks like about every whip tail I've ever seen. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, so no, th then that's the problem with whip tails. I mean, uh, um, I know Dale Turner's a big lizard man back there. And uh, if he's anything like me, and I know he's a lot smarter, uh, I struggle with whip tails to this day. And I was so glad when they got rid of Sonore, or not Sonore, uh, Flagellicata, because I couldn't tell Flagellicata from Sonore forever and like it came up with all kinds of imaginary things and then come to find out they're the same species and so and that's the problem with whip tails they all are so similar and they're difficult to get in your hand so how many of us really take the time to look at a whip tail when it runs across from us and we see the guardian over there and there and and so this thing may have been there for forever and everybody just ignored it and thought it was fell off which is really common up in that part of the world and so you know i don't i don't know um, so yes, it, it does look a lot like other whip tails we've seen. <clears throat> so this guy is the latest thing I was kind of involved, well, one of the latest things I was kind of involved with, white spotted wall gecko. Uh, um, Miss Garcia uh, finds this white spotted wall gecko and she contacts us and we think, well, that's kind of interesting. Almost at the exact same time, another white spotted wall gecko is found in South Phoenix. So we all team up and we start putting together a paper on them that we, we published in 20, uh, 2020. These things are big snout bent lizards. And uh, uh, I swear when I was out surveying for these, I, I swear I was in Namibia looking for uh, pachydactylus on cliff faces because it was everything was just the same. These guys um, have popped up in a few different locations in Phoenix and then over in East Mesa. Uh, the really troublesome thing with them um, is that we found out that uh, um, pet shops were selling them to homeowners for scorpion control. Buy a few of these guys, let them go on their house to eat scorpions. And that seems to be where they came from. And we uh, did a survey this spring, Tom Jones and I, over in Camelback Mountain on those bluffs right there. In about two hours, we found 66 of them. Oh, wow. and, uh, and on these walls in this parking area, and we found them from yay big to you know, alligator. So I mean, these things are well established. How long have they been here? Uh, we don't know, but we're thinking maybe as far back as pre-1995 um, that, that they've been here. So the cat's out of the bag with these things. There's no way we're going to get them. What's terrifying to me is, um, um, well, uh, we'll go through a couple of things. Uh, they are common on anthropogenic structures. And uh, so you find them on homes, buildings, all kinds of stuff like that. 
They could be easily confused with a med gecko when they're babies. Big difference is the scanter pattern. Uh, Phyla, or, uh, Hemidacris has divided scanters, and you'll see a picture of that as opposed to a single plate across the uh, toe or a series of single plates across the toe or continuous plates across the toe. And so we think this gecko is going to move everywhere. And so Camelback is where we did the survey. This is the habitat around Camelback. And you can see if they were releasing them on their homes around Camelback, and then they quickly moved on to the mountain. Um, there's nothing really stopping these guys. They're as happy out in the Sonoran Desert as they are on your backyard wall. And there's just, there's just a sea of houses connecting Camelback Mountain and these other localities to the surrounding mountain ranges. I'm terrified of these things. I don't think they're like the Armageddon lizard, but I think they're going to eat the heck out of Zantusi and stuff like that. And I love Santusia. And so, you know, that, I mean, this could be a big nuisance. Um, whether it's going to drastically change ecology, I don't know. But I do think we're talking a matter of time before they pop up here. I've also got a report from Tucson. From Tucson. Um, and uh, it was found downtown Tucson. So please keep your eyes open for these things. They're incredibly wary. They're very, very difficult to catch. They, they are really a mess. They're often out on very cool nights, but the best way to search for them is the way we look for geckos in Africa, is put a headlamp on or a flashlight between the barrel of binoculars and scan surfaces at night and you get eye shot. And, and, and you can see them from 80 yards away. And so this is a really effective way to, uh, to hunt these geckos. But yes, please, please inform us if you get any of these things down, down here or other places. I'm Anyway, I'm, I'm, this is one of the ones I'm really concerned. The other thing is that once they get into these ranges, what's stopping them to jump to the, you know, the Matazals or the Pinals or heaven knows who, where, you know, they, there's, they, there's almost a countless areas they can go because they love Arizona and its habitats. This Sonora Desert habitat is much like the uh, Africa and Morocco, those kind of places they come from. All right, so uh, rough tail wall geckos. Um, Small little guy, first pops up in 2014 at the Game and Fish office, and I'm cleaning out a bay there, and I find all these little eggs, and I'm thinking, ah, those are the smallest hemidaculous eggs I've ever seen. You know, like me, or you know, well, if you knew me, you wouldn't be surprised to kind of uh -huh, and go off doing whatever. And um, and then I'm going in the office one night to look over the doorway, and I think that's kind of an odd looking hemidaculous. Go in and do what I'm doing another dumb moment and then i'm moving a canoe with a guy and there's a gecko in it and it's scrambling to get up the side and as we're moving i'm thinking oh look at the hemidaclis and i'm like well if that was a hemidaclis he'd ride up run up the side of that canoe like nothing and then so it was, all of a sudden the light went off on uh, it and sure enough it's it's this guy and so i did uh you know uh wrote up a little note uh, published it but then did some subsequent surveys and stuff like that like 40 of them just on one of the buildings alone at the Game Fish oh, Compound in Mesa. And it's a small building. I mean, they're everywhere and they're little bitty guys and there's big guys. And so they've been there a long time. And this goes back to, you see what you expect to see. And I'd always seen Hemidaculus on that building. So any gecko I was seeing out at night with bumpy skin was gonna be doggone Hemidaculus. And I just had that in my head. And even though, I knew better, eggs were too small, the thing didn't look quite right. It wasn't until that aha moment a month or so later that I realized I was looking at something different. So all I'm saying is that just don't accept what you're seeing because you think it ought to be this or that. It, it could very well be something different. So anyway, um, most likely avenue for this are, are uh, uh, stowaways and cargoes. And so not long after these guys pop up in Mesa, they end up in uh, Gila Bend, um, and that comes in the initial report, but then they pop up in Yuma, and then they go all the way over to Buckeye, and they pop up in Tucson, and they pop up in a couple other spots. These guys are gonna go everywhere. The problem with these guys, even though they're most commonly found on anthropogenic shelter, they readily colonize landscaping. And so I found them out in the Game of Fish Department in our cactus gardens and boulder or rock gardens, stuff like that. That worries me. If you they get into an area like 
some of the houses adjacent to Push Ridge or uh, up next to the Tucson Mountains or South Mountain or something, are those guys going to move into those areas? And I think they will. And so this is another exotic introduction um, we don't know much about. We don't know how big of a threat it is, but I think it's got a very good chance of escaping into the wild. Also, just anecdotally from personal observations, when these things pop up, med geckos seem to disappear or their numbers drop way down. So that suggests to me that there's some kind of uh, agonistic or competition thing between those things, and that might have deleterious effects for our native lizards. Good old uh, Hemidacalus turisticus. So described by uh, Mike Robinson and Mr. Romack out of Tucson here back in 73 when they were low students, they found them. I, this is the lizard that sparked all the exotic stuff for me. And I find them in, uh, in the late seventies in Chandler. Uh, it had already been published. Of course, I didn't know anything about publishing back then. Uh, I was just playing with lizards. And, uh, and, uh, and then uh, Stebbins puts actually a lizard from my mom's house. That's the ones pictured in Stebbins, uh, 85, uh, we sent it to him. The, um, uh, anyway, they were kind of novel, but this is one of those rare things that seems to have found a niche that was unoccupied and they've been a benign introduction. We never find them off of homes uh, with the exception of occasionally in desert, desert locks or vacant areas where people are taking dump, the trash out and dumped it and they're in the trash pile. They don't move out from it, far as we can tell. Um, there was no nocturnal uh, lizard living on anthropogenic structures, so they filled a niche that was unoccupied. Um, I've been doing some uh, prey item stuff on screech owl nests up in the Scottsdale area. They're bringing a lot of hemidacalus to their young. I mean, uh, um, uh, yeah, so they're, they're hunting around the porch lights in Scottsdale and grabbing these guys and feeding them along with banded geckos and other things uh, to the young. So anyway, these guys have seemed to integrate into the whole all picture of Arizona without much problem or much threat to anything. <clears throat> so this is the one that Addie uh, started the landslide on. Um, this is the uh, brown and old. Um, again, like I mentioned, uh, book wasn't out of two weeks and, and, and uh, he asked me why we didn't put the brown and old in it. And, uh, and so uh, right about the time he called, one pops up in a cantaloupe shipment originated in Arizona. And it's a sealed box, and the ag inspectors open it. There's a there's a there's a, an O in it. I cannot make sense of that. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me that that's there, and I still really question that record. But but it was there, and according to them, it couldn't have got in there. It had to be in there at the time the box was sealed and shipped. However, the ag inspection station was in Florida, where Brown and Knowles are a dime a dozen. So what do you do with that? I don't know. I, I'm not comfortable with it, but I can't, I can't say those guys have it all messed up. So uh, up in, two, in Phoenix, there's another big nursery, Seamus O'Leary's, and then Green Things down here in Tucson um, is where Addie had seen them. So we find them at Green Things and at, at, uh, and at Seamus O'Leary's. Seamus O'Leary's doesn't have greenhouses, but by sheer volume of water in the Phoenix area, they've turned that nursery into Southeast Asia. Wow. Uh, I mean, I, I can't imagine their water bill. And the brown and are just jumping around there, happy as clam. And, uh, and if you look on Ag Naturalist, they're kind of spreading out to some of the neighborhoods. I'm not particularly concerned about this animal, oops, because I think we're just too dry and too hot for them to survive outside of these really specialized habitats. I don't know that. They're incredibly adaptable. They've taken over Florida. They've moved up the uh, uh, Atlantic coast all the way into uh, Georgia and South Carolina, I think. And so they're tough. They can put up with some pretty cold temperatures. And, but still, we're talking about humid environments, not Arizona dry. So um, anyway, something we're man monitoring and watching. They seem to be uh, breed. I mean, they're obviously breeding in the nursery there like green things. And they appear to be laying their eggs in potted plants. So they've got an automatic dispersal mechanism. And when you buy a plant and you take it home, there may be an, a free anolin uh, in it. And so uh, whether they survive after hatching, who knows? Okay, spiny tail iguanas, we all know about them on, this, uh, on the grounds of Sonora Desert Museum. Introduced sometimes in the 80s, they're a hybrid uh, iguana. 
They seem to be staying largely on the museum grounds. And they, um, they uh, um, I know that a few of them have been found off the museum grounds, but our big fear, of course, originally was that they'd colonize the whole Tucson mountains. And those fears have been unfounded. So um, maybe it's just a little too dry outside of the museum grounds and they can get what they need there on the grounds with all the landscaping and stuff. Um, who knows, but they appear to be another one of these things that are just isolated there, not causing a big problem. What are these spiny tilde gum iguanas hybrids with? What are those really making? Uh, it's another uh, two different spiny tailed iguanas. It's macrolopa and conspicuosa. And so uh, that's, anyway, that's what we were, we were told about. Aren't, aren't hybrids usually infertile though? How are they reproducing? <laughs> no, well, these ones aren't. Uh, and so, uh, uh, um, yeah, that so there's a lot of stuff that I learned in science class, and well, that we all learned in science class that you know, um, um, one of the things that defined a species was they couldn't breed with another species. Well, we know that's not true, and and so a lot of those traditional lines of thought don't tend to be gospel and as firm as we thought. That might be a general rule, but that is not the absolute rule, and so there's always ex an exception. To it. All right, so, um, so anyway. You can, you can go down and see spiny iguanas every day of the year if you want, just about at the Desert Museum and enjoy them. Again, don't seem to be a big problem. Oscillated scheme. This is one you guys are going to have if you don't have already. Um, they are great stowaways in potted plants, and they've been established all over, like Florida and other places, and all over the Middle East and Mediterranean area. Uh, they've hitchhiked their way around and become established. They're really good at it. They are fabulous at surviving in uh, urban uh, situations where you've got degraded habitats and monocultures and house cats and kids with BB guns and all that kind of stuff. So th they are able to live in these places and they, and they don't only survive, they thrive. So uh, these pop up, um, 2007, John Gunn finds one in his front yard. Um, independently, a, a few years later, Rob Bowker finds one in his yard. They both live in the same neighborhood in, in Gilbert. So Rob goes around with flyers because he's going to try to figure this out. And he said, have you seen this lizard? Can you help me? Hands one to John Gunn and said, yeah, I just I found these years ago. And John is a retired biologist from the Game and Fish Department. And so they team up and then they end up with Brian Sullivan and they've published this paper about the introduction of, of, um, of these skinks. By the time they find them, they are there. They are really abundant. They are in a relatively small area, um, just a, a few kilometers, but they are doing really well, all side, side classes. Obviously been out for a, quite a while. And so they interviews with people, put them back as far as 2001. And so you're probably talking about a 1990s introduction, maybe a date on these. And so, Fast forward to 2020, just as we're working on the field guide, we get a report of one 13 miles away in central Phoenix. And then another report of one about two miles south of that in central Phoenix. So already they're, you know, they're, they're spreading around the Phoenix metropolitan area. Um, and so they, uh, they do really well. They really like our climate. Um, they're uh, ovoviparous, so they're given live birth, which are, as we all know, that's a big advantage if you have babies that can run and avoid predators. Um, and interestingly, like a, unlike a lot of their relatives that bury themselves in sand and flee by hiding in cover like that, these guys love to hide in bushes. And you can see what a successful strategy that would be in an urban situation, to run into hedges and stuff where things can't get you. So, so how big of a threat they are? I would worry about them getting into some of the river bottom situations. And I think they might be potentially a problem there. Long as they're confined to neighborhoods, there's just not a lot of damage you're gonna do because those are rather depopulate when it comes down to most lizards and other things that they're gonna be. So they're gonna be feeding on roaches and things like that, crickets, stuff like that. Not gonna be doing, uh, presenting much of a problem to wildlife, native wildlife. So the Brimony blind snake, this thing gets reported actually in 2013 officially. But Phil Rosen, and Cecil mentioned them in a report way back in 2002, uh, that one was found in Tucson. However, when I go back to iNaturalist or I look in museums, there's no specimens from Tucson in any of the museums. 
So if you get one of those puppies, kill it, put it in a jar, take it over to the museum, get that thing accessioned. So we've got a hard data point. Um, they are most certainly here because if you've got a uh, biologist, you know, the quality of Cecil and, and Phil talking about, and there's no question that they're here. Why they've not been reported, I can't explain that. So they may not be abundant, but uh, um, they're most certainly here. Even when you look all over, even all this time, there's only 32 records that I naturalist uh, of these things, and they're all in the Phoenix area. So they're difficult to observe. They're very secretive. You're not likely to see them unless you go looking hard for them. And where they seem to pop up most readily are in irrigated neighborhoods. And when they irrigate, they come out of the ground like worms. And this guy brought me some in a jar of water one time. And he said, uh, I've got these aquatic blind snakes. And they're, they're, those things are panicky. I said, well, they're not aquatic. <laughs> but uh, but uh, the, yeah, the water did flush them out. And so, um, and he said, every time he irrigates, he gets a whole pile of those things coming up out of his yard. Um, they are thought to be fairly benign, but I can't imagine these things are not competing with Rena cumulus, um, you know, our native blind snake that's common in a lot of urban situations. I mean, I, I just can't fathom that those guys aren't going head to head on some of uh, uh, some of the resources. So this thing is going to move everywhere. It's going to be, I mean, it's pretty much going to be in every urban center and stuff. In Australia, they reported it out into some aquatic or some mesic habitats. And, you know, with the similarities that we've got in Australia as far as climate stuff, I think that potentially could happen here. And we certainly like to avoid that. But I just, you know, I just don't know how you can do it because them being parthenogenic, one animal constitutes a population almost, right? All it's got to do is survive and start reproducing. And then and you've got them established. So this is one of the most successful uh, um exotics globally it is it is gone all over the world and it's every place you can name that thing is there just about <laughs> so the we'll finish up with this guy uh the uh southern water snake pops up in about 2015 and uh sharp uh publishes it in 2018 in 2016 um he, he finds it and reports it and of course everybody says well we're really interested in that he finds like 16 the next year when he starts actually looking for them. And then uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, gets in there, or USGS gets in there to, uh, to try to assess if we can get rid of these things because we're already afraid that they're going to, uh, they're established. And they find a whole pile of them, all different sizes. And they discover that not only are they not basically centered around that Imperial Dam area, they go six kilometers up and down the river on either side. And so, bam. You know, uh, again, once we discover them, cats out of the bay, no controlling these things. And these things potentially are a very big problem for uh, rancid frogs and native fishes because these things get big. They have really big litters, like 20, 21, and uh, they're long lived and they're really adaptable. So this, this is one of the things we would like to keep down there on the Colorado River. But we fully expect it to move all the way up the Colorado River in both directions and out all the tributaries to it. And then um, through the canal system, infiltrate the inlet. So, uh, you know, you guys, your, your guys are what you see the very beginning of it. Just as I was working on this, I had a conversation uh, with Tom Jones um, and, uh, and he tells me, uh, Oops, that they've just, oops, where am I going here? Okay, they've just moved up the river. They were confined right here to this little area. They just moved all the river, way the river up the river to Dome. So they've made like a 20 mile push, wow. uh, we've just discovered up the river um, in these few years. And so uh, I, again, I don't think there's any really stop in these things. Um, uh, we would love to, you know, but, and you could kill everyone you see, but it's going to be kind of like swatting flies in a feed yard, you know, so uh, um, I, I'm just not, I just don't know what we can do. Um, and, and again, really problematic. We don't know how these things got there, but we assume through the pet trade, there are a couple populations established in California, but even the pet trade, I have a hard time making a sense because these things are really nasty. I mean, they smell bad and they fight like crazy. I mean, this is, 
you might as well give your kid a pet piranha. Uh, of course, they've done that too. So anyway, uh, so the, uh, uh, you know, this is just a, a bad idea all the way around. All right. So what do you see if you, uh, what do, you do if you see an endangered species? Please document. Don't just look at it and say, oh, you know, I wonder if that's supposed to be there. Get a good identifiable photograph. Better yet, get the critter in a jar. Get it to somebody, lots of people in this room, organization that can help you with it. Figure out what it is and if it's supposed to be there. Then report it. Share your data, share your information. We want to keep a database on what's here and where it's going. And so let us know anybody uh, where to get. But ultimately, we'd really like to get that information to the state wildlife department, the game and fish uh, department, and Tom Jones, because uh, we're I'm working very closely with Tom, but that's the clearinghouse for this information. And I'd be happy to take your report, but I'm not really the guy. I'm the guy that's really interested in it and kind of monkeying around with it, but it really needs to go to the management agency. Get a voucher. So whether that's a photograph or a specimen, get something that proves that's what it is and it's there and get that to a museum. So voucher that thing in Arizona uh, State University Museum or uh, University of Arizona uh, Museum. Um, they both take photo vouchers and they'll take specimen. A, uh, U of A, unfortunately, they've defunded a lot of the museum program and there's just a few people working on it right now. We used to send all our specimens down here. I never put anything in ASU. ASU has gone the exact opposite direction and they have got an incredible collection. So right now, everything I collect is going to ASU uh, because I know they've got money and it's getting looked after. So uh, I would recommend you do that, but don't forsake U of A. I mean, it's a great place and it's got a fabulous history. I'm just concerned about the future of the Herbs collection. So um, um, my recommendation again would be ASU at this point. And then lastly, get really good information. When did you see it? Where do you see it? Get a GPS point, get a nice written description. Give details, it was out on a rainy day, um, you know, or after rain at night or whatever it was, get that information, provide that with the voucher. Most of all, be observant. So special thanks to uh, Annie uh, Limroth and Jeff Martineau who helped me with a couple of photos of things I didn't have. Um, any good picture you saw, it's probably from those guys. Um, uh, Tom Jones, uh, was a big help um, because he's been doing bull, a lot of bullfrog stuff and he turned me on to a few resources that I was totally unaware of and we've been exchanging a lot of information um, so uh, I really appreciate his help and if you're interested here's basically the cited material and I guess you can get this offline later um, for the program all right uh, yeah thank you for doing that. Any questions, Tiffany? I'm sorry, I've gone too long. Yes. Yeah, so I've got a tip for you on hemidectomies. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I literally see them every night at my apartment. <laughs> okay. So what do you want What do you want me to do for them? Well, I, I think, I think, and so even this is, I think, is important. Um, so even though they're well-known from the Tucson area, I catch one of those guys, put it in a jar, get it to the museum with the date on it, because that gives another data point. And, and we want all of those. And, and so, again, not a big problem, and that's not even anything uh, really surprising, but it's still important. And that's the big thing about voucher and specimen. Everything shouldn't be some kind of landmark or landscape. Those things are, are really important, but the everyday stuff, going where it is and when it was there, is equally as important. I've tried to capture them, but they're pretty fast. They are pretty fast, but you can do it. You know what you want to free one? Is get a super soaker with ice water. <laughs> any uh, any other questions I can help you? Yes. So about the rough tail geckos, you made it sound like like they're not really spreading into uh, areas besides like urban yet. Um, I have found one just north of the White Tank Mountains. Um, when I I was road cruising, I paused and I started like hiking up into it, and there was one running along like well out of any urban area. It was. Uh, is that pretty well recorded? Yeah, I, I would uh, love yeah. to know that before I put this product presentation together. No, so that is super important information because that confirmed the fear that I had that I had no data to back up. Exactly. And so uh, I just some observation. So yes, you know, please, if you've got a photo that can be the voucher, anything to get that to a museum. We, I mean, we need to know that stuff. 
because where it was, what it was, and what it was doing, especially off the building, is super important. Anything else? Uh, anyway, you can catch me afterwards. Like I said, I've gone way too long. Thanks for uh, your patience. <laughs> Um, okay, if you haven't purchased any raffle tickets, uh, you have a Let's do it. Let's do it.